What is up, YouTube? This is your host, Renny B, here to spill that homicidal tea. And today, we're brewing up an arson-laced extra evil blend of tea to spill around these parts. As always, please like and subscribe and share. And um, because there's a lot of great homicidal content around here, all solved. Well, yeah, all, well, sort of. I mean, like most of it's solved. And if it's not solved, then... I think it should be, and it's my channel. So anyway, now that that's all that out of the way, let's dive into the solved homicide case of Effie Rachel Williams Ratley. Effie Rachel Williams was born on October 20th, 1977, and people would describe her as a very sweet, amiable person with a special zest for life and the utmost respect for all living things, big or small. Well, sometime in late 2004 and early 2005, after walking out to her car, she discovered that she had a flat tire. Now, a young man came to assist her, and she had no idea that this man would become her husband just 18 months later. She also probably didn't realize that he would become her ex-husband, and then her husband again <laughs> over the next year or so. You know, it was an on and off again thing. But once they moved past the on again, off again part of their touch and go relationship, they settled into their married lives and had a son named Aiden. Not too long after though, like a few weeks after Aiden was born, tragedy struck this new family and a fire tore through their trailer just a few short weeks later. Michael and Aiden were thankfully able to leave the dwelling unharmed, but Effie wasn't so lucky. She was still trapped inside. So she was rescued by her husband, Michael, after he smashed the window with a satellite dish and was able to direct her through the smoke and the flames to freedom. Michael was hailed as a hero by the neighborhood newspaper for his valiant, what? valiant efforts. A fire investigative team determined that the house fire was accidental in nature and the cause was actually faulty wiring with non-working smoke detector. Well, days after the fire, a teary-eyed Michael Ratley told local media outlets that love is what drove him to save their lives. I mean, he continued saying, I might have lost everything physical, but I've still got my two most precious things. I try not to think what could have happened if I wouldn't have woke up. It's too scary to think about. That is so sweet. Well, now homeless, Michael, Effie, and Aiden moved next door to Michael's parents' house to try to start over. But less than a month after the house fire, on January 27, 2007, Michael had nodded off in the living room with their infant son when he was jarred awake when he heard some sort of commotion coming from his and Effie's bedroom. He scrambled to the room where he heard the sounds coming from, and he found Effie bleeding on the bed, and the bedside window was wide open. Michael immediately called 911 and handed the phone to his father, whom they were staying with, so that he could actually get sent to their son while his dad reported the incident. When Michael's father talked to dispatch, he described Effie as appearing to have fallen, maybe, or something like that. She just looked unconscious. When the first responders got there, they immediately transported the unresponsive mother to the nearest hospital. Her outlook was bleak, and the doctors on staff alerted the family they did not have faith that Effie would even make it through the night. And if she did, she would most likely have severe traumatic head injuries, rendering her brain dead. Doctors had determined that a total of seven blows to her head had occurred. These wounds were made with a blunt object that had some sort of star-shaped marking that was due to it. They're not quite sure if it had like a star-shaped pattern on it, but there was definitely some points that were made with the impact. So the blows were all on Effie's head and neck area. Now, Effie did indeed make it through the night, but just a few days later on January 31st, 2007, the families decided to take Effie off of life support. She was only 29 years old. She was barely a mother and had only been a wife for a year. Well, what started out being an investigation regarding an attack or an accidental fall, this started snowballing into a homicide inquiry. Detectives took no time zeroing in on Michael and his many discrepancies to his story. Michael had told investigators that it looked like someone entered through the window and inflicted these injuries to his wife. The screen was taken off from the outside and sat down right below the window outside. 
like in a position that it couldn't have been if someone had lifted themselves through that window into the room. But there's this. The attack had occurred on a cool night and the ground was covered in frost. There were no fresh prints outside the window. I am so sorry. I had to. I mean, I know this is a horrific story, but I've got a problem <laughs> with memes, so deal with it. Anyway, what is especially sus is that Michael had reported an incident the previous evening before Effie was attacked. Now, Michael claimed that while he was outside in the barn, he was struck in the head by an intruder. Whew. Well, Michael's father is the one that called 911, and when they came out to the Ratley's house and barn, uh, crimes against person investigators noticed that nothing had been taken. I mean, Effie's wallet, pocketbook, all that stuff were out in the open. Nothing was moved. Nothing was rifled through. It was the exact same thing that occurred the night of Effie's attack. If the motive had been robbery, there were plenty of things that these perps would have taken. They just didn't. And on the night of the attack, the perp, or perps possibly, also didn't track anything in the house. Um, weird. The detectives found that pretty odd because there was also a layer of dust and a basket of garments that sat in front of that window that they came through and it was not disturbed. The carpet was also spotless. I mean, it would have been dirtied up by outside debris, blood or footprints or whatever, but whatever. While watching television, Michael's parents claimed they had not heard anything. Additionally, a neighbor who just happened to be Michael's sister. Okay, is this a damn neighborhood cult? I mean, cult compound or something. Jeez. Anyway, Michael's sister said that she and her husband had eight hunting dogs who would have barked if they heard any noise that was out of the ordinary. She said they heard nothing that night. So that's really not good for Michael. That's for sure. The police searched his house and they found, well, his parents' house technically, and they found in Michael's belongings, a portable DVD player, lubricant, and some porn. I mean, man, I ain't judging you. You do you and your private time, boo. But what piqued my interest was when investigators went through Michael's cell phone records, they found Michael maintained contact with a 35-year-old former high school teacher. And oh yeah, that teacher was a dude. So now one theory is that Michael was maybe gay and wanted Effie out of the picture so he could start a new life. Who knows? When the investigators spoke to her family, they told them about when Michael had previously tried to kill Effie. Um, what? Yeah. Effie's family told investigators that one time that piece of crap Michael put live mice in Effie's car console. You know that little glove box storage thing between the seats? He called Effie while she was driving and asked her to look in the console for his medication. Well, she opened that console and freaked the out and uh yeah she skidded across the street and could have died in a horrific car accident okay the detectives started to think that the house fire a little while back wasn't an accident at all they actually thought that on the only reason that he attempted to save effie at all was because his family and friends started showing up at the scene that night but there's one more thing that really sealed his fate michael was the beneficiary on effie's 150 thousand dollar life insurance policy but pff, that's never a motive <laughs> well at this point police were looking for every shred of evidence that could verify that michael committed this murder when michael's bathrobe was forensically examined the team found no signs of blood but remember there's a phrase all good things come to those who wait well they became the embodiment of that statement. When police searched Michael's truck, they found an odd little customization beneath the seats of his truck. It was a secret little compartment that someone had created. When they pried it open, they found a red stained hammer, a box cutter, a piece of burnt electrical wire, some wire cutters, and a slew of gloves and rags. Mm. Hello. The exposed burned wiring in Ratley's trailer was compared to the charred electrical cable found in the secret stash box of Michael's truck. It ended up matching perfectly. Forensic investigators also identified Effie's blood on the hammer in the secret box. When compared to Effie's head wounds, the pattern on her head matched a hammer hitting a circular object perfectly. That's the star that was made. It was that curve with the flat surface being introduced. Well, the circle has no way to do anything but splinter. That's with a star pattern. Well, they proved that was the murder weapon. But we're not done. Effie's blood was found on multiple rags and paper towels in that stash box that contained all that stuff. But wait for it. Her blood was found on the latex glove in the secret compartment. There's more! Those same gloves? Forensic detectives found Michael's DNA on the inside, 
her DNA was on the outside and his was on the inside. What the prosecution believed was that Michael had been planning to kill Effie for a while. He had previously attempted it, and on that fateful January evening, he finally succeeded. The prosecution asserted that Michael had made up the story about the intruder barn story, stupid story, to persuade these poor people of Bryceville, Florida, that there was an attacker on the loose. Oh my goodness. Well, the prosecution thought that Michael killed Effie while he himself was naked. He wiped himself off with paper towels and rags because there was blowback on the wall. And I'll show that there. He changed into his bathrobe after he cleaned off. Well, no blood on it then. Quietly ferreted all the evidence away in his little hidden stash box compartment and only then contacted 911. Michael testified on his own behalf at his hearing. Big mistake, idiot. He claimed that he was extremely upset and totally baffled by what they found in his usually unlocked truck. Convenient. And that he was being framed. Dude, stop. Thankfully, in July of 2009, after four hours of deliberation, nine women and three men found Michael Ratley guilty of first-degree murder in the death of Effie Ratley. Now, this is Florida. Death penalty stayed. And that is exactly what prosecutors were going for. So, on August 17th, that is when they started the sentencing portion of old Ratley. And I am so disappointed in you, Florida. The jury decided on life in prison. Really? Really? Why? Anyway. I mean, the fire that he set, that could have totally killed a baby too. Like, what if he wasn't able to have gotten out uh, or gotten the baby out? I mean, like, you never know. I mean, fire is nuts. You can, but you can't predict it. You know what I'm saying? So it could have gone crazy and just walloped that whole trailer sooner than he could have expected and trapped him in there. I, but maybe that ex-teacher was waiting outside with an extinguisher. Hmm. I wonder what ever happened to that guy. Who cares? Anyway... Michael's rotten away in jail, so his son Aiden, he's probably 15 or so by now. God, that poor kid. I wonder if there's a victim's fund that, like, pays for therapy and all that, because I hope so, because poor Aiden, he didn't do anything to deserve this. Effie didn't either. None of these victims ever do. It just sucks that these monsters rip through families and just screw everything up. For what? Dude, if you're gay, be gay. Lead your best authentic life and co-parent after the pain goes away from your wife you would have had to leave. And then you can show your son how awesome of a dad you can be by living your life who you are. But instead, well, where you are, I guess it can't hurt being gay. <laughs> oh, I know one way it could hurt. Allegedly. I don't know if he's gay or not, but whatever. He's trash, so that I do know for certain. That is it for this case. Have you ever heard of this one before? I ripped it straight from Forensic Files. I think it was season 14. But, so, I mean, some of you may have heard of it before. But if so, let me know if I missed anything. And if not, what do you think? Until I see you in the next video, try to keep your <laughs> together and not murder anyone. Really?